Hello, welcome to Monday night. It's been an exciting day today. Uh, woke up with a flood in my bathroom and had to get that fixed and then it took a while and it's still leaking, but it'll be okay. So, once again, sorry that this video was late. I'm sure you've been waiting for it all day, but here it is for you. And I'm going to go ahead and get it out of the way. Today's secret word is flood. So today's secret word is flood. Alright, anyways, moving on. Today's topic is the early republic, the era of federalists and good feelings. And really what we're talking about here is the time period after the Constitution has been signed. So the era of the federalists begins really in 1789. Now, the first government is going to be formed in 1789. This is going to be the first government under the Constitution. And, surprise, George Washington is the first president. He runs unopposed. And he was the commander of the colonial army. He had been an important, influential figure in Virginia. And he's very cautious about everything he does. He knows that he's setting president. I, nobody knows what to call him. They're like, do we call you your honor? Do we call you your royal highness? And he says, no, just call me Mr. Mr. Washington. So that is why today the president is known as Mr. or hopefully one day Mrs. President. And one of his jobs is to appoint secretaries. Alexander Hamilton, he becomes the secretary of the treasury along with a Broadway star. A guy named Henry Knox becomes the Secretary of War, which today would be the, the Secretary of Defense. Thomas Jefferson is the Secretary of State. Edmund Randolph is the first Attorney General. That's the highest legal official in the country. And then Samuel Osgood is the Postmaster General. Uh, that's the one who runs all of the post offices, which back in the day was a lot more important than it is now. You also have the legislature. So you elect the House of Representatives, you elect the Senate, and their first job is going to be passing the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was the only way to get the last couple states to join the Union, and it's the first thing that the legislature is going to start working on. There were originally 12 amendments pa or passed, and 10 of them are ratified, so two of them don't actually make it. Although, strangely enough, one of those two that don't make it eventually does, but not until 1992. So the Bill of Rights, as you know, freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the right to have their arms, I mean the right to bear arms, protection from search and seizure, fair trial, no cruel and unusual punishment, and then there are certain rights that are reserved for the states. Basically, if it's not specifically in the Constitution, it's for the states. Now, if you're curious what that 11th Amendment was that never passed, it was about pay raises. And Congress can give themselves a pay raise, but it doesn't go into effect until after the next election. So that was on the books all the way from 1789 until 1992 when it was finally ratified. Okay, you have the judiciary, and if you're curious who that guy is in the corner, that is John Jay. He is the first Chief Justice of the United States. And our court system is created with the Judiciary Act of 1789. And the way it originally worked, there were five associate justices, one chief justice. Today there are eight associate justices and still one chief justice. Something that's a little different then compared to now, the Supreme Court justice was expected to go and visit different parts of the country. Each of the judicial districts had a Supreme Court justice who was assigned to them. And that's why they're called the circuit court, because the justices of the Supreme Court would ride in a circuit around all the lands they were supposed to control or be in charge of. Now, those 13 judicial districts that were only for 11 states. Uh, in 1789, Rhode Island and North Carolina had not yet joined the Union. They don't join until 1790. And then there's three courts of appeal as well. And the whole Constitution, um, where does it say we're supposed to have a Judiciary Department? It's in Article 3 of the Constitution, if you're curious and want to go read more. Okay, so there's some drama under Washington's presidency. First of all, Alexander Hamilton, he wanted to be very, very powerful. He wanted to be more important than he actually was. Not to say he wasn't important, but he 
kind of forced himself into being important. He wanted complete control in economic matters. And one of the things he does is he creates the first national bank of the United States. This is supposed to be like a clearinghouse where all the money funnels through, and its job is to pay off war debts, raise and create money, and establish the value of the currency. Now, some of the problems with that is a national bank was nowhere in the Constitution, and he uses Article 1, the Necessary and Proper Clause, which says basically if it's deemed to be necessary and deemed to be proper, then the government can do it. He also passes an excise tax on liquor, and this leads in 1794 to something called the Whiskey Rebellion. It happens in western Pennsylvania, and George Washington, of all people, gets on his horse, puts on his military suit of armor, and rides out to western Pennsylvania, ready to put down this rebellion. And when it's found out that, oh, it's the president here ready to kick our butts, the rebellion stops and a deal is worked out. All right, partisan politics. These are not true political parties. They're just factions. Political parties are going to develop a little bit after this. But while George Washington is president, there are two factions. There's the Federalist faction and the Republican faction. Now, just a little side note, this is not the same Republican Party we have today. The Republican Party of today does not form until during the Civil War. So don't think that these are the same Republicans. These are separate. But moving on from there, the Federalists are mostly from New England. The Republicans are mostly from the South and from the Mid-Atlantic. The Federalists think that the U.S. has a bunch of enemies both inside and outside the country just waiting to pounce on them. The Republicans, they say, well, what are you talking about? We're a brand new country. We have all of this potential. Federalists are about law and order. The Republicans, they're about political participation and states' rights. President number two, John Adams. This is the first election. It happens in 1796 that there are more than one person running for the presidency. John Adams is originally Washington's vice president and he is going to run for president in 1796. Jefferson was originally the Secretary of State. He's going to run for president in 1796. They're from different factions. Adams was a Federalist. Jefferson was a Republican. So what happens here? Once upon a time, our election system was different than it is today. In the first couple presidential elections, whoever got the most votes got to be president. Whoever got the second most votes got to be vice president. Fast forward to today and just imagine what would have happened under the original system. You would have President Donald Trump and you would have Vice President Hillary Clinton. Just some food for thought. So what happens in this first contested election of 1796? Adams wins, Jefferson becomes vice president, and they don't like each other and they don't work with each other. Now some of the bigger things that happen under John Adams' presidency, there's something called the XYZ Affair. Uh, to make a long story short, the French are going to start stopping American ships and seizing them and boarding them. And the United States is going to go in 1797 to France and some diplomats are going to try to talk to the French government about it. And the French government says the only way you can talk to us is to pay us $250,000 and give the French government a loan of $12 million. So basically it's $250,000 just to get in the door. 12 million dollars to talk to somebody. Now why is it called the XYZ affair? Because there were three French agents who were talking to the diplomats. Agent X, Agent Y, Agent Z. Well the XYZ affair, the, the news of this breaks out in America and this war fever happens and people want to declare war on France. John Adams asks Congress to create a navy and rebuild the army 
And for two years, from 1798 to 1800, there is an undeclared war happening between France and America. It almost blows up into an actual war, but at the last minute, the two sides are able to work out an agreement. Something about Napoleon having his hands full with fighting in Europe, he didn't want to fight the Americans too. Another big thing that happens under John Adams is the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien Acts are going to increase the amount of time somebody had to be in this country to become a citizen from five years to 14 years. And the biggest reason that was done, most of the new immigrants supported Jefferson and the Republicans. John Adams saw this as a way to weaken that other faction. The Sedition Act limited free speech. In fact, this was the harshest law limiting free speech that the country's ever seen. It made it a crime to write or say anything insulting against the president, against the Congress, or against the government. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Jefferson didn't really like that very much because it weakened the party or the faction he was starting. And the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions were written by James Madison of Virginia and Thomas Jefferson for Kentucky. And in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, they argued that the citizens spoke through the states and what the states wanted represented what the people wanted. It becomes the basis of the idea of states' rights. The states were what were supposed to determine if the federal government acted in a constitutional manner. Now that has since changed, but this idea of states' rights is gonna be very important in the beginning of this country. All right, moving on, the era of good feelings. This is what happens after the presidency of John Adams. Uh, we go on to the election of 1800, and we have Adams versus Jefferson round two. Um, Adams overall, not a very good president. A lot of people didn't like him, and they really wanted Je Jefferson to be president. Well, the government and the, the people in charge of the election, the Electoral College, thought they had figured out, hey, I know how we can fix the issues that we had with the previous election. It was decided that there would be a presidential candidate and a vice presidential candidate. And this is where things get a little bit strange. All of the electors, the people in the Electoral College, were going to be allowed to vote for two names. So the idea was John Adams and Charles Pickney would have people that supported them. Everybody would put John Adams on one ballot, Charles Pickney on the second ballot, but one person would leave Charles Pickney's name off. And it worked for them. Adams got 65 electoral college votes. Charles Pickney gets 64. But when it comes to Jefferson and a guy named Aaron Burr, it doesn't quite work the same way. Jefferson and Burr both get 73 electoral college votes. And then they get the same amount over and over and over again. And it takes 36 votes before Thomas Jefferson is declared the winner and becomes president. Now Jefferson, he elected president, he says, can't we all just get along? And then he tries to reduce the power of the federal courts. And then he gets rid of the Alien Sedition Acts too. Now the big things that happened under Jefferson's presidency, there's the court case Marbury versus Madison that you have already read about, or at least you should have. Um, to make this story short, on John Adams' last day as president, he signed a bunch of positions, created a bunch of judges, and did what every president does on the last day. Well, for Mr. William Marbury, his letter saying that he was a duly appointed judge didn't get delivered until after midnight. And technically, Adams wasn't president anymore. So Jefferson didn't honor Marbury's letter. So Marbury goes to the Supreme Court and says, hey guys, I'm supposed to be a federal judge. Can you make sure I get my position as a federal judge? And this court case, Marbury versus Madison, happens. 
And in the end, it's ruled that yes, Marbury should be a judge, but it's not the U.S. Supreme Court that can do it for him. And because he didn't go to the right court, sorry, you're out of luck. Ultimately, this is going to be the basis of judicial review because the Supreme Court had to go through and review the Constitution. And from this court case, you get the idea of constitutionality. The Supreme Court can rule something constitutional or unconstitutional, and they're the only ones that can do that. You also have the Louisiana Purchase. When we get to the early 1800s, Napoleon of France, he's in a war with just about everybody, including probably his mother, and he needs money. So Napoleon decides to sell Louisiana, which included all of the land between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains, basically. Jefferson buys it, 827,000 square miles, and he only pays France $15 million. That averages to three cents per acre. Now, there are two guys that are sent to go and explore all this land. There's Meriwether Lewis and there's William Clark, better known as Lewis and Clark. Yes, Sacagawea was a real person, went part of the way with Lewis and Clark, but she did not go all the way to the Pacific Ocean. She actually died fairly early into the journey, and nobody actually knows where Sacagawea is buried. But anyways, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, they explore the Missouri River, they cross the Rocky Mountains, they go all the way to the Pacific Coast and say, yep, there's an ocean there. And then they come back and they report on everything they saw. There's a second guy named Zebulon Pike. He's not as well known, but Zebulon Pike is going to explore Colorado and he's going to explore parts of New Mexico. Let me fix this presentation. Uh, one second here, I'm gonna pause the recording. Now Jefferson does not run for a third term and his Secretary of State, James Madison, is going to become the president in 1808. Now what do you need to know about James Madison's presidency? Well, the War of 1812 happens while Madison is president. Now what were the causes of the War of 1812? There's the impressment of American British sailors. Now that's not saying, hey man, nice, nice uniform or anything like that. What they mean by impressment in this case, the British ships of the British Navy were stopping American ships, boarding them, searching for people that they claimed were escaped British sailors, and then forcing them to work as prisoners on British ships. Now at that time, you know, they didn't really have passports or driver's license or anything like that. So you could have been born in the American colonies and all the British Navy had to say was, no you weren't, and they were taken. There's also the Chesapeake Affair in 1807. Uh, the British Navy fires on the USS Chesapeake, almost sinks it, and people don't really like that, of course. And then there are all these, there's this group of people called the Warhawks who are in Congress who are demanding war against Britain. Now, ultimately, this war doesn't go anywhere. It's not very good. The United States isn't prepared. There's no Navy. There's no army. Um, the U.S. is basically like, let's go to war. Okay, what's next? Well, I guess we have to create a navy and an army. So that's kind of how the war goes. Uh, most of the fighting is on the water. There's fighting um, in the Atlantic Ocean. There's fighting in the Caribbean. There's fighting on the Great Lakes. Uh, Washington, D.C. is burned. The Star Spangled Banner is written. And in the end, this war is a draw. The United States tries to invade Canada, that goes horribly. Um, there are two Native American leaders, Tecumseh and Prophet. They're defeated by a future president in Indiana. The Creek Nation is defeated in Alabama by another future president. Um, and there's also something called the Hartford Convention that's happening. In 1814, some representatives from New England states meet because they think the war is going to be a loss. And they say, we need to either rewrite the Constitution or we need to create our own country. Well, surprise, surprise, the war ends and a draw, and suddenly these people at the Hartford Convention look like big fat traitors, and 
most of these people at the Hartford Convention were members of the Federalist Party, so the Federalist Party looks like big fat traitors. Kills off the Federalist Party because nobody wants to be part of that. All right, so the war is over, and we have a plan. This is an economic plan. It's a great plan called the First American System. It's his plan put to uh, rebuild and strengthen the United States after the War of 1812 is over. It's led by a guy from South Carolina named John C. Calhoun. It's led by a guy from Kentucky named Henry Clay. And it's led by a guy from Virginia named James Madison. The plan was to recreate the National Bank, make sure it kept going, raise a tariff on American imports, that way people will buy American goods instead of British goods or French goods, and grow American industry. Now, John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay, they wanted to build roads and build canals too. Madison says, no, that's not our job, that's the job of the states. Part of this first American system is the McCullough versus Maryland Supreme Court case. It happens in 1819, and that established that the federal law is more important than state law. A uh, long story of this one, Maryland placed a tax on any bank not chartered in the state of Maryland, aka the National Bank. And the U.S. Supreme Court said only Congress can create banks per the Constitution. Now, that's changed a little bit, but that's the way it looked at the beginning. There's the adams onus Treaty. That's how we get most of Florida. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine says, hey, Europe, stay out of the... Western Hemisphere will take care of it. And then the Missouri Compromise is going to expand slavery. And then last but not least, you have the Panic of 1819. You don't have to be a historian to know the word panic is bad. And this is a big economic crash that happens after the War of 1812 happens. It starts in 1819. Um, there's a credit crunch that happens. Manufacturing slows to a standstill. A depression is started. And that depression is going to last all the way until 1823. All right, so for this week, discussion seven, discussion eight, quiz seven, quiz eight are all due by Sunday night, and your second reflection paper. For your second reflection paper, you can use any of the readings from last week or this week. So that's what you have coming up this, for this week. And next week, believe it or not, midterm already. So uh, be ready for that too. I'll give you a, a study guide on that probably this weekend. Anyways, that's it for today. Once again, sorry the video was late, but better late than never. And we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.